Hello. So I'm Janet Beach. I'm the chair of the UK Women's uh, Budget Group. And I'm going to talk to you about an example of how you can use gender responsive budgeting. And this time we're going to talk about how it can be used to make the economic case for women's equality. Um, and the example I'm going to use is violence against women and girls. And we're thinking here about how we can provide services and deliver services by building an economic case for government investing um, in, in the proper services. So let me go back to the uh, first slide. So normally what we do when women's organizations try and build the, the, the case for, for government doing something, they talk about the moral case, they talk about the legal case. So for example, we've got the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women. Uh, we've got the Sustainable Development Goals. We've got the Istanbul Convention from the Council of Europe. We've got laws against violence against women. And we can say as much as we like that it's wrong. But one of the things that worked very well in the UK was when we were able to say to government that if you stop violence against women and girls, it will save you money. That economic case made a big difference. So I'm going to really quickly go through in the next 10 minutes or so, the four steps of gender responsive budgeting using violence against women and girls as the example. And the four simple steps that everyone can follow to do this are first of all, gathering the right data. Uh, secondly, how do you give a voice to the women and girls who are most affected by this issue? What analysis can you do? What resources have you got to develop your analysis? And monitoring the results. So making sure that you can evaluate whether what you've done has been effective. So let's look quickly at step one, which is gathering the data. In the UK, we started off not having very much data and I'll come back to that later. But once we were able to make the economic case, we were able to use the data we had and improve on it. And you can see here that I've shown the figures for sexual offending in England and Wales, very high rates, um, more than 2% of the population and women four times as likely as men to be affected. We have the Crime Survey England and Wales, which shows that 25% of women have suffered from some form of partner abuse over their lifetime. And then we see at the bottom the statistics that show the link between economic autonomy and poverty and your vulnerability to violence. So if your household income is less than 10,000 a year, you're much more likely to suffer from domestic violence than if your household income is 50,000 a year. And if you're living in social housing, which is where uh, most people on low income live, again, three times as likely to suffer from partner abuse as if you owned your own home. So these are the kind of figures that are really important to be able to demonstrate what the problem is and why something needs to be done about it. And it's making this kind of case that it has enabled us to improve on the number of services that are provided and the quality of those services. So step two, I said, was voice. Making sure that we're listening to women, listening to the women in the community to find out what the problem is. And for this, one of the ways in which we did it was by improving the Crime Survey England and Wales data collection. So this is a survey that's done every year, uh, about 30 odd thousand, a little bit more sometimes um, in the sample. And it's done through a self, what they call a self-completion module, which means that um, where you're talking, where you're asking questions specifically about domestic abuse, sexual assault and stalking, the person who's doing the survey hands you the tablet computer and you're able to answer these very sensitive questions yourself. And that means that this figure of 14% will disclose sensitive issues face to face. Only 14% of women will do that in an interview. We got four times that number when we started to move to this self-completion approach. 
and this has provided us with the most reliable source of data so far. And what was the role of the Women's Budget Group in this? Well, we're an alliance of feminist economists and we worked with women's violence services because those services were able to provide us with the frontline data on costs and demand. So we were able to see that the number of women who went to the police, which was the only records we had originally, are far fewer than the actual number of women who are suffering from violence. And in some minority communities, um, the number of women who will go to the police is even lower than the number in the mainstream community. And our economists did the number crunching for this and provided the analysis. And then we were able to put the economic case to government saying, this is how much violence there is. This is how much it's costing you. Okay, so let's look at that step three of analysis and women uh, and men being differently affected by different sorts of policies. This is the first um, calculation that the first uh, gender responsive budgeting that was done in this area in England and Wales by Professor Sylvia Wolby, who's one of our women's budget group members. And she calculated these costs that you can see here. First of all, the costs for 2001, and then the costs for 2008. And the comparison is quite stark. So the amount that was invested in services was just over 3 billion in 2001, and almost 4 billion in 2008. But if you look down the, uh, the, the graph, you can see that economic losses reduced and the human and emotional costs reduced, which meant that the overall costs in England and Wales were just over nearly 23 billion a year. <clears throat> but by the 2008, they'd gone down to around 16 billion a year. And what that meant was, because we'd made this greater investment in services, we were able to see a big return on investment. The economic losses had reduced, and the human emotional costs had reduced as well. And this is what I mean when I say that being able to make this economic case was the thing that made a difference to us being able to ask government to invest in services and in prevention of violence. And step four, we look at evaluation. So let's have a look at what's actually happened. What's actually happened is that government has now taken over making this economic case and doing these costings. We no longer have to do it in the civil society sector. And government's own calculations now show that domestic violence alone costs around 66 billion pounds. So much more because these are now much better quality figures than the ones we were able to produce. And as a result of this central government funding on refugees, rape support centres, national helplines, FGM and forced marriage units, these have gone up exponentially. And we've introduced a new system of funding rape support uh, services out of the victims levy, which is an extra amount of money that all victims, pay, uh, all uh, perpetrators, criminals pay. When they're fined by the court, a certain amount is is allocated to the victim's levy. And that means that the taxpayer is not paying for these services. So that's popular with both government and with taxpayers. Okay, and then finally, um, I've given you some links to further reading if you're interested in seeing more about how this is, how this has all been done. But the kind of key message I wanted to leave you with was this idea that what is very useful, what is incredibly helpful about gender responsive budgeting is when funders are able to give money to women's grassroots organisations to do the sort of calculations that I've talked about, to find out what the problem is, how much it costs, and then we're able to make the case to government for them investing in it. So an investment in making the economic case in doing the gender responsive budgeting is able to leverage much more funding from the state and from the EU. Thank you very much.